Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society. We come to you tonight from the ancestral lands of the Nipmuc tribal community, a community that continues to thrive here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of the American Antiquarian Society, and tonight I'm hosting Vincent Brown and Marie Elaine Cars in a discussion of slave rebellions in the Atlantic world. We're especially pleased to present this program about African struggles for freedom in the Americas a century before the American Civil War in anticipation of Juneteenth, a few days from now. I'm also joined by AAS Director of Book History, Kevin Wisniewski. Before introducing tonight's guests, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the American Antiquarian Society, as well as welcome everyone here tonight. AAS was founded in 1812 by the printer Isaiah Thomas. We are, re we are a research library and learned society located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We're devoted to understanding and sharing the histories and cultures of North America before the 20th century. As a library, we collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts. In addition to this virtual program tonight, we have a variety of other public programs. We offer visiting research fellowships, and prior to the pandemic, we welcomed scholars and readers from around the world to use our reading room to work on their own research projects. And we certainly look forward to the day when we can do that once more. We're happy to present programs like the one tonight free of charge, though of course running such programs isn't without expense. If you wish to help support programs like this one, we'll be posting a link that where you can donate in the chat room. And before I introduce tonight's guests, Kevin will offer a quick overview on the platform we're using for this program. Kevin? Hello, Scott, and hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are currently hosting this program in Zoom webinar, uh, and there are two functions that I would like to highlight for you today. Uh, first, if you move your cursor to the bottom menu bar, you will see the chat function, where, you, uh, uh, where I will share uh, some helpful links, uh, including uh, links to upcoming AAS programs, uh, to publisher pages where you can purchase uh, the, uh, the titles uh, in discussion tonight, uh, and much more. Uh, second, you will see uh, the Q&A function. Here, not only can you submit questions to our guests, but you can also vote questions that are already submitted up that queue. Uh, following the talk, Scott will read off as many questions as time allows. Finally, uh, I want to let everyone know that this program is being recorded. For those who could not attend, the video will be made available on the Society's YouTube channel. So enjoy the program, everyone, and Scott, back to you. Thanks very much, Kevin. Now I'm delighted to introduce our two guests for this evening. Vincent Brown is Charles Warren Professor of American History, Professor of African and African American Studies, and founding director of the History Design Studio at Harvard University. His most recent book, Tacky's Revolt, The Story of an Atlantic Slave War, was awarded the 2021 James A. Rawley Prize from the Organization of American Historians and the 2020 Sons and Daughters of United States Middle Passage Phyllis Wheatley Book Award for nonfiction research. It was also a co-winner of the 2021 Annis Field Wolf Award for nonfiction and a finalist for the 2020 Cundill History Prize. Marie-Elaine Cars teaches Atlantic history, early American history, and women's history at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and is a senior editor for international labor and working class history. Her book, Blood on the River, a chronicle of mutiny and freedom on the wild coast about a massive and nearly successful slave rebellion in a Dutch colony that is now the Republic of Guyana on the Caribbean coast of South America, was published by the New Press in August 2020 and came out in a Dutch edition in January 2021. NPR included Blood on the River on its best books for 2020 list. Vince, Marie-Elaine, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you and with Marie-Elaine and with uh, 
with everybody who's joined us here this evening. Thanks. I'll just get us started by thinking to, about the decade that your books both occur, because both, both books are about events in the Caribbean and the Atlantic world in the 1760s. When people in the United States think about the 1760s, we often think about the events leading up to the American Revolution, as if the American Revolution were always going to happen. Events like the French and Indian War, the Stamp Act Crisis, and more. But both of your books invite us to reframe or rethink the 1760s and the age of revolution more generally. So let's start there. Seen from an Atlantic world perspective, what did the 1760s look like? Hmm. I don't know, Do Marlene, you want, you want to start? Sure. So I think seen from an Atlantic world perspective, Scott, the 1760s are a period of enormous social ferment. Um, not only in the American colonies, but in the Caribbean, in Europe, uh, and in fact around the world, because the Seven Years' War has a huge impact around the world and, uh, and slavery exists everywhere. And so what we see in the American colonies is, of course, people thinking about how they can create a better world. But we see the same in the Caribbean, in South America, and, and in Europe, so that it's a period, maybe a little bit like the 1960s, where uh, there's a lot happening around the world. And a lot of it has to do with people wanting to end social injustice, wanting to create a better world for themselves, wanting greater autonomy, and various elites trying to keep all that tamped down so that their own position won't be threatened. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I mean, Marlene sets up the context really well. And just to broaden that out just a little bit, you mentioned the American Revolution. We're used to thinking of this 18th century period as a period of tremendous growth and expansion in European empires in the Americas. And it certainly was. And that growth and expansion is headed towards a period, a period of crisis, which we see becoming sustained from the 1760s on through what we call the Age of Revolution, you know, through the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the French Revolution, and then the, the revolutions that lead to the independence of many Latin American countries, in South America. So, you know, this period is about to come apart. And the 1760s kind of is right on the cusp where, you know, the growth of Atlantic slaving empires um, have really reached, you know, in some ways, uh, at least in the British case, they're reaching their apogee. I think it's worth going back and remembering it you know, when we think of the American Revolution, certainly in our, you know, in our elementary schools and our high schools, we tend to think of the 13 American colonies that broke away from the British Empire and became the United States. But of course, in the British Empire alone, there were 26 American colonies. And by far the most profitable, most militarily significant, and most politically significant, best politically connected of those colonies were those colonies in the Caribbean, with Jamaica being Britain's preeminent colony uh, in the Americas. Now, the period that we're studying has slavery and the transatlantic slave trade at its heart. The reason Jamaica and Barbados and those other Caribbean colonies were so profitable is because you had armies of slaves growing agricultural crops for export, with sugar being the most profitable of those crops, being the most profitable commodity that was being traded within these empires. So inevitably, as you look at the Atlantic world, you will see that those colonies that have the most slaves uh, and are growing sugar and other agricultural commodity crops are the most profitable territories in those empires. With Jamaica, as I said, being the most profitable in the British Empire and with Dutch Guyana not being quite as profitable as Jamaica, obviously, but being an important, important location for the Dutch Empire. Now, as Marjolein said, um, this is a period when a lot of people are trying to think about how they want to make a better world. So in some ways, our traditional concern with freedom in the age of revolution becomes even more important when we begin to think about slavery, right? The people who are most oppressed, uh, most want and need to create a better world are those masses of enslaved people growing the most profitable products in, in, in the empire. So Maya Ling were both trained uh, at Duke University in the 1990s, as it turns out, um, by many of the same people, including uh, Peter Wood and David Barry Gaspar and John J. Topaski, um, uh, Raymond Gavins and others who tried to get us to think about this world from below. 
to think about the people that, you know, that made the world what it was, those laborers, especially those enslaved laborers who made those profitable territories, to try and think about freedom, what other worlds were possible, struggle, crisis, from the perspective of those people from the bottom up. And that's why I'm always so happy to talk to Professor Cars because I think we share that fundamental assumption, even when we diverge in our interpretation of various events, we share that fundamental assumption that it's always important to start with those people working and laboring at the bottom of society and look up from there because that's how we truly understand freedom. That's how we truly understand what worlds are possible and what kinds of change needed to happen in the 18th century and I would say needs to happen now. That's a fabulous introduction and really an entree into telling some of the stories because each of you has written a book about a rebellion by enslaved Africans in this period in the Caribbean. And so a lot of our, a lot of our listeners tonight, a lot of our viewers tonight might not be familiar with Tacky's Revolt or with the rebellion in Berbice. So I'd like to invite each of you just to tell us a bit about the stories that you have, have found and reconstructed in your books. Um, starting with, with Tacky's Revolt, Revolt in Jamaica, we can also, uh, at some point in this, we'll, we have a map that shows the Atlantic world with Jamaica and Berbice highlighted just so that folks can see the geography that we're talking about tonight. Vince? Yeah so, I, yeah, so we'll go chronologically um, in a short span of time in the early 1760s um, and start with April 7th, the night of April 7th into the morning of April 8th, 1760, which happened to be Easter uh, in Jamaica. And uh, a group of Africans, we are pretty sure, led by an enslaved African man named Taki, who was from the Gold Coast of West Africa, roughly the area that's now Ghana. Uh, and probably a Ga speaker and a Ga chieftain from the Gold Coast of West Africa at that, led a group of armed rebels in an assault on Fort Haldane in the parish of St. Mary. Uh, from there, they, they attacked several plantations, burning plantations along the way, um, up through the heart of the parish, which was um, a, a lightly settled parish, a densely forested parish, and a parish where they thought they would have some opportunity to either take the entire parish, the commercial zone in the parish, or escape into the mountains um, uh, and to create a kind of alternative society there, an escapee community, what was called a maroon community um, in Jamaica. Now that revolt was suppressed uh, within a couple of weeks and suppressed quite brutally by a combination of militia forces, but also the British army and the Royal Navy and uh, maroon adjuncts. So some of those maroon communities who had escaped before this gets into a longer story, but just briefly, many maroon communities who escaped before had fought battles with the British, so much so that the British didn't know they would be able to keep the island, so that they signed treaties with maroons in 1739 and 1740, um, which granted those maroons their autonomy, so the British stopped harassing them in the mountains, but by diplomatic treaty obligated those maroons to police future slave revolts, which in the case of Tacky's Revolt, they did. So that combination of counterinsurgency forces suppressed that revolt in Jamaica within about two weeks. And then there was another massive revolt, a number of different conspiracies and little uprisings across the island, but another massive revolt in the parish of Westmoreland uh, on the Western side of the island on May 25th. That revolt lasted several more weeks on into months, um, finally suppressed probably by the end of the summer, largely, and then that yielded to a large force match, a force march uh, of the remainder of the rebels across two parishes that lasted into 1761. So all in all, the, 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 the scope of the uprisings was island wide and lasted all the way through into 1761. And I think if you kind of look at its full extent, it was about 18 months or so. Um, about 60 whites were killed. Uh, many more uh, uh, enslaved people, about 500 enslaved people killed by the counterinsurgency forces and another 500 um, exiled from the island for life. So that was that event, although it wasn't the last slave revolt in Jamaica, even though it was the largest slave revolt in the 18th century British empire. Thanks, Mary Lane. Well, my rebellion takes place a couple of years after uh, the one in Jamaica. It starts in Berbice in February of 1763. Uh, Berbice is a small colony, maybe 5,000 enslaved people, some 
350 Europeans and another 350 enslaved indigenous people. And when the rebellion breaks out, the Dutch panic instantly. They realize that they are uh, well, that they are totally uh, over uh, outpowered. Um, and rather than fight back, they, they flee. And so the rebels pursue them to the coast where most of the Europeans leave for other islands in the, or for islands in the Caribbean or nearby colonies. And the Dutch governor stays in Berbice with a small force. He digs himself in on a plantation near the coast and he stays there for the next year and a half while the colony is basically in the hands of the former slaves. Um, the uprising is led also by a man from the Gold Coast, uh, uh, in, uh, a man whom the Dutch call an Amina, which is a sort of a diasporic ethnic identity forged in a new world uh, among people who come from similar geographical and uh, uh, areas in West Africa, speak similar languages. And the Yamina are in charge, but it's clear that the revolt is a, uh, a coalition of different ethnic groups and that also Creoles, people born into slavery in the colony are a part of it, but the Amina are clearly in charge. So Coffee sets up a government, uh, his second in command, Akara, sets up a military and then follows a large period where neither the Dutch nor the, the rebels can, can overtake the colony, but but the rebels remain in charge, but they don't succeed in, in kicking the Dutch out altogether. And then a number of extraordinary things happen. Um, Coffee opens diplomatic um, negotiations with the Dutch, basically saying, let's divide the colony in two. You guys get the southern half near the ocean, we'll take the half that's further inland. Uh, we do wanna trade on the coast and I will do my thing with my people in my half and you can do whatever you want in your colony. And the Dutch uh, are eager to keep these negotiations going, hoping that in the meantime, reinforcements from Europe will arrive. Twice, Coffee starts these negotiations. Twice, they're broken off because he realizes the Dutch are not involved in this in goodwill. Eventually, his people revolt against him because he is trying to negotiate with the Dutch. He commits suicide and new leaders come to the fore. This is by now the fall of 1763. And then increasingly, you see that different visions of what freedom ought to look like uh, begin to manifest itself and, and people, um, these various leaders have a harder time keeping their followers together. Uh, there are some infighting. Um, and then finally, at the end of 1763, at the very last day of the year, reinforcements arrive from Europe. But even with these thousand soldiers or so, it takes the Dutch another five, six months before they regain their colony. And the fact that they regain it is largely due to uh, American Indian allies, as well as some crucial rebel leaders who joined the Dutch uh, in the end when they see the writing on the wall. So when the Dutch are finally back in control, they start judicial trials. They kill in rather gruesome ways, 130 people or so. And altogether, perhaps a third or a fifth to a third of all the enslaved people who used to be in Berbice lose their lives in this rebellion, either through hunger, deprivation, fighting, uh, disease, and a number are taken to other colonies. And, and when you mentioned that the ju judicial proceedings that the Dutch begin, those proceedings are in part why we have a record of, of the events. And so one of, one of the challenges when, when I think about doing the kind of history that both of you have done in these books is the challenge partly of finding sources at all and then of, of analyzing and interpreting those sources because they're virtually never written from the perspective of the rebels, of the, of the enslaved people let alone the perspective of indigenous people in both in both Berbice and Jamaica who were involved in these stories as well. So how did you find the stories? If you tell us a little bit about the detective work you did and also how you interpret sources in order to do exactly what Vince said earlier, which is to understand the history from below, not just the history from the perspective of the Dutch or the British colonizers. Sure. Do you want to take that first, Vince? <laughs> 
Well, sure. I mean, I'll just I'll start by admitting that I, that I have remained incredibly jealous of Professor Carr's in her ability to have found those 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 trial sources because I searched and searched and searched and never found any of the records of the hasty trials that were also conducted in the wake of Taki's revolt. If anybody's listening and you're out there and you're sitting on those trial records, I'll still take them uh, for a potential second edition um, and you may change my interpretation. But, right, we also have the advantage of the fact that there has been a very long and engaged and quite enlightening conversation, especially in African-American studies carried on by scholars such as Michelle Roth Trio and Saidia Hartman and Marisa Fuentes about how one reads these sources, reads between the lines of these sources, uh, interprets the silences um, that are produced just in the normal course of making history, but also produced by the fact that, you know, some stories some people have the power, right, to inscribe their stories and some people don't. So some stories are easier to tell and they can be told in more detail than other stories and they can be told from some perspectives more easily than other perspectives. So we all face that challenge when we're trying to do this work. I mean, I'm looking forward to a book by a, a young scholar that I admire named Greg Childs, who's working with these kinds of sources to examine the Taylor's conspiracy in the late 18th century in Salvador Bahia, so that we can understand, as I think Cars brings forward a bit in her book, right, what the black public is like. When black people can gain some modicum of control or when they can articulate a vision for what the world ought to look like, what does that public look like? So I think that's the larger question that some of us are trying to ask. Not having had those kinds of sources I had to fall back on another kind of thing, which was to think about the geography of this slave revolt and to use geographical and cartographic sources imaginatively to try and think about how this slave revolt knit the world together and in a way that will shape our geographic imagination. So if I couldn't talk about that black public in as explicit terms as, as Professor Carr's uh, could in her book and as people like Greg Childs and others are in their work, what I could do is remind people that this revolt is really just the tip of an iceberg or better yet, a current in a larger eddy of forces uh, that connects Europe and Africa, the Caribbean and North America. And really think about how the implications of that transform the way we think about what history matters in this early American world. So, you know, we're left kind of with the legacy of, you know, the philosopher GWF Hegel saying Africa forms no historical part of the world, right? There's no dynamic movement there. There's nothing that one has to kind of examine when one thinks about history. And it's certainly the case that when the historical disciplines are set up in the 19th century and on through the 20th century, African history is not a significant subject for mainstream historians. Africa is the province of anthropologists, right? So we hadn't really taken seriously the fact that there's a whole dynamic history of transformation in Africa that sets these, these, these events in motion in the Americas, right? You mentioned the fact that, you know, both of these revolts in Jamaica in 1760 and Rabisa in 1763 were led by people from the Gold Coast. Why is that? It's Gold Coast history that we then have to examine. So what I was able to do then was trace the trajectories of many of these people between historical contexts in order to knit together that geography in a way that I think, I hope, reshapes our imagination of what matters where, right? Whose history travels and reverberates throughout this world, and therefore ultimately, like how we really understand the history of freedom and revolution in that late 18th century period. Yes, Vince does, a, I think, a, a, a beautiful job in his book. Uh, filling in for, for, for where sources are no longer exist, uh, su such as those uh, judicial investigations, and thereby pointing out very many different possibilities and making connections uh, that in fact you may not have been able to make quite in the same way, I, I think if you had not been forced to. So I think that worked uh, really well. In my case, I was extremely lucky uh, that these uh, hasty trials, because in Berbice too they were hasty, that those records still exist, so that I have 900 of these sort of mini slave narratives to work with, as well as these this written correspondence that Governor Coffey and the, the leader of the revolt and Governor Van Hogenheim, the 
uh, the governor of the colony wrote back and forth to each other. And so I have an, uh, or I had an, an amazing opportunity to look at um, how people presented themselves, what they talked about, what they thought were plausible stories to tell, um, how they interacted with each other through these interrogations. And that allowed me to really look at this rebellion from the bottom up and look at what rebellion looked like in people's daily lives so that we don't just learn about the rebel leaders who are crucial, of course, but we also learn about the rank and file, many of whom are not necessarily that interested in rebellion, who want to make sure they keep their children safe or their provision grounds or keep their chickens alive or in many cases have a different vision of what post-emancipation life ought to be, uh, ought to look like. And the, the vision of the Amina is not one that everybody shares. And so in my case, it was more, uh, it was less uh, uh, milking the sources I had for every bit that was in them, but rather making sense of an, of an abundance of sources. Um, and I did that by creating spreadsheets and using databases and transcribing everything so that I could use these little snippets and put them together and create stories of many different people. But also to begin to sketch, as, as uh, Professor Brown said, sort of the intellectual life of, uh, of uh, enslaved and now self-emancipated people in Berbice and to begin to realize that this rebellion was a very complex rebellion and that just as in the American Revolution, people had different visions of what the revolution ought to be all about. We see the same in Berbis. Um, some people want to be Maroons. Some people want to have an, an African-based state. Some people just want to be left alone and do their own thing. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the sources allow us glimpses of things we don't normally we, we don't normally get to see. And in the case of your book in particular, those sources also allow glimpses into the lives of women, not just men in Berbice. Yes, absolutely. yes, absolutely. And it, it shows that, um, that there were a number of women who were important in the leadership of the rebellion, never in a formal way, but as informal um, advisors to rebel leaders. These were almost all women who were either married to these men or related to them in a, in a, uh, as, as sisters or, or mothers, for instance. Um, but I was also able to show that um, many of the hardships of the rebellion, of course, were borne by women. I mean, men endangered their lives by fighting, but women had to keep families together, had to keep their children safe, had to feed their kids as people moved from spot to spot to spot because people didn't necessarily get to stay on their plantations. And I think that I was also able to see that in a rebellion, there are more opportunities in the 18th century for men to advance themselves and take on new roles than there are for women. And that in, in many ways, rebellion is more emancipatory for men than it is for women. So a lot of interesting dynamics around women that are visible in these sources, yes. I think one of the things that both of these books show um, is that women were integral in, in various ways to these revolts. Yeah. I mean, in some ways it kind of amplifies something that Aisha Finch really brought out in her book, Rethinking Slave Rebellion in Cuba. Um, in my book, I found one example where of the, of the first 25 rebels who are captured by the British, they're captured and they're put aboard a Royal Navy warship to be brought around the island for torture and trial. Of those first 25 rebels, 40% are women, right? Are identifiably women's names. Um, so we don't know exactly what they were doing in that initial outbreak of the rebellion in St. Mary Parish in 1760, but we do know that as far as the counterinsurgency was concerned, those people were people that needed to be captured and tried. Um, that's a pretty big number because 40% is about the percentage of women in the population in that parish in 1760. So we know that women are proportionally represented you know, in the first phase of the outbreak um, in its most violent phase as well. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's, these are stories that aren't told on so many levels. And I'm, I'm interested in some of the terminology used. Marielaine, as you were talking about um, the events in Berbice, 
you use the term rebellion. Um, interestingly, you know, Vince, the title of your book is Tacky's Revolt, the story of an Atlantic slave war. Um, and of course, there's also the term revolution. When we think about what happened in the 13 mainland colonies in British North America, we call it the American Revolution today. Of course, if it hadn't succeeded, it would probably be the American Rebellion um, or something else. How do, you, how do you decide what words to use? How do, how do historians decide what words to use to describe events that were part of the lives of people at the time and that ended in different ways and, and had different sorts of, have, of trajectories? I think it depends in part where you're coming from as you approach your, your, um, your topic or your question. I came uh, to this rebellion as, a, as an historian of the American Revolution. I had written a book about the Regulator Rebellion on the eve of the American Revolution in North Carolina. And when I came across these records in the Dutch archives and realized how extensive they were, I thought it's interesting that we so often look at slave rebellions in their own category as if they have nothing in common with other rebellions of farmers, for instance, or mine workers or whomever. And I was really curious to see whether this rebellion would prove to be as complex as the American Revolution, albeit on a smaller scale. And indeed, I, I found that it was, that we have different groups of elite men who have different views of how, what ought to happen, that we have different groups of uh, uh, people who want to participate uh, or do, do not want to participate, who, who participate for a while and then drop out or the other way around. Um, and that people have very clearly different visions of what freedom ought to be like. And so the people themselves used the word war, uh, as Vince does. They also used the word revolution, and they also used the word rebellion. And so um, I think that what happens in, in Berbis is an attempt at revolution, for sure. Uh, and if Coffee had succeeded, he would have been the, the he would have been Toussaint Louverture, because Berbice would have been independent as he wished 30 years before it happens in Haiti uh, in the 1790s. So I think actually the word revolution is appropriate. Uh, but Vince has very good reasons, I think, for for talking about it uh, as a war. Yeah, I actually don't disagree that the word revolution is appropriate, but I but I like to wear it lightly. Mm -hmm. I have been influenced by especially scholars of the Haitian Revolution um, that recognize that, you know, a majority of those, those participants in the Haitian Revolution, the fighters, are from Africa, right? And their understanding of the war that they're engaged in is not the understanding of the given by the French Revolution, right? Um, as you said, Scott and Marilene, you acknowledge as well, um, you know, we, we often attribute, you know, the term revolution is something post facto, uh, when we know how it turned out, and we kind of know, you know, that they people created a state. Um, but at the time, the terms more often in use were, were war, or insurrection, or revolt, or rebellion. Um, and so I wanted to, to, to stick with that for a little bit. Um, because part of my aim here was to really bring out the predicament, as I think Professor Carr's book does so well, to really bring out the predicament of the rebels, right? And not look forward to the end, because we already know that the rebellion was doomed, looking back on it, right? But they didn't know it was doomed, otherwise they wouldn't have, <laughs> they wouldn't have fought it. So I wanted in some sense to kind of, to imagine that moment looking forward, as opposed to kind of attributing, you know, a post facto category looking backward. Now I was aided by this, by you know an early passage in um, in uh, Gustavus Vasa Olada Equiano's narrative of his life, where he says, you know, when you make people slaves, you compel them to live with you in a state of war. And so I wanted to take that seriously as an intellectual proposition that slavery itself was a war, in fact generated by a lot of these other wars around the Atlantic world. And for people who don't know you know, somewhere between half and, you know, as many as two thirds of the people who were enslaved in Africa um, had been enslaved either as war captives or as people who were made vulnerable by their displacement from wars, right? Or the kind of the state collapse and the famine and the other things that wars cause. Now the scale of wars in West Africa increased in part with the slave trade because uh, one of the products that, you know, people were trading slaves for were firearms, right? So there was a kind of nice exchange, especially on the Gold Coast, um, of firearms and other goods 
for enslaved persons, which has increased the scale and lethality of these African wars and coincidentally increased the scale of the slave trade and the numbers of enslaved captives who were available to farm those products and build those profits for European empire. So in that sense, colonial capitalism, imperial capitalism had as its basis a war economy, right? No war, no laborers, no war, no territories. Europeans are fighting these wars with each other to take and defend their territories, to displace Native Americans. Africans are fighting these wars for weapons that they can then you know, go to war with their enemies with. And as a result, these war captors are going out to the Americas to build these European empires. So what I wanted to do is, as I said, see Taki's revolt as an eddy in these larger currents of warfare. And it was Olada Equiano more than anybody else who had tipped me to that framing device, that optic, which allowed me to see this world in a different way. Now, would this have been a revolution had these people had, been t- had taken the island? Absolutely, everybody would have called it a revolution had they taken the island. Had they even held it for as long as uh, the rebels in Barbice, I think they would have called it a revolution before they had su- suppressed it. Now, let's remember that the French, in the case of the Haitian Revolution, were for years thinking that they were going to reconquer Haiti and that, that, that Saint-Domingue, right, as they still continued to refer to it, was still their territory. So, you know, again, the kind of word revolution is a post facto categorization that I think when we're in the moment, when we're in that predicament, we, we want to wear lightly in order to understand all the forces in play. In so order, that we're not projecting forward and looking, and looking ahead always. Right, in order to understand the people's experiences as they're living them and not, and not looking back from what, what the result was. I want to invite folks to uh, use the Q&A function to, to ask questions of our speakers. We have one question already from Laura Macaluso, uh, who's wondering if Professor Brown might comment on the Gold Coast connection to the Amistad slave revolt. In what ways might Tacky's revolt have foreshadowed the Amistad rebellion, or were things just so, just so different 70 years later that the connections are tenuous? So uh, if, uh, if you put the map back up, we can, we can point to it. But the Amistad rebels were from an area of the coast that's now Sierra Leone, um, kind of you know, uh, west and north of the Gold Coast. So different people, you know, we'd say different ethnicity, um, and consequently, they were engaged in a different history. Also a history of conflict on the West African coast, a history of warfare. Uh, and so um, many of those people, as Marcus Redeker has shown, were from the Poro society and were uh, elite warriors, many of the Amistad rebels were elite warriors themselves in West Africa. And I think you can make a comparison, a very rough comparison between you know, their, experience, their military experience in, in, in Sierra Leone uh, and the experience of these Gold Coast warriors that ended up in, in Jamaica or Berbice. But these are different histories, right? So kind of when one wants to, wants to draw connections, you can draw uh, sociological parallels, but I don't think the historical connections are pretty, are very tight. What I will say is that they are part of that same process, right? As warfare kind of expands the orbit of European rule, and as warfare produces Africans for sale to the Europeans on the African coast, those conflicts travel around the Atlantic world. And I think that what we see in Taki's Revolt, what we see in the Berbice Rebellion, and what we see in the Amistad Revolt are part of a similar kind of process of warfare and migration. Now, that wasn't the only rebellion aboard a slave ship. There were hundreds, thousands more. Um, and so you could just as easily situate the revolt on the Amistad uh, in, within those revolts on, on slave ships, um, as opposed to these revolts on land that we see represented in Jamaica and Berbice. Thanks. Question from Lynn Thompson. Do you plan or do you know other scholars who are planning to write about Chateauier's revolt on St. Vincent in the Caribbean? There's a good book on that and I can't remember the title, but there is a good book on that that just came out a few years ago. Um, If you Google around, you'll find it. I just can't remember the title of it right now. It's not it's not a big book, but but it's a pretty good one. Yeah. Uh, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, I'll, I'll ask another one. Um, as, as I read both of your books, another, another 
population that's part of your books are the indigenous people of, of these places. Um, so in addition to the stories of Europeans and of Africans, we have people um, who've been living in these places before there was European colonization and before there was African enslavement there. Um, how, how do, how do the indigenous people of Berbice and of, of Jamaica figure into these stories? Because the alliances do seem to shift in interesting ways. Well, in, in Berbice, indigenous people proved to be absolutely crucial. They are really the folks who made Atlantic slavery a possibility in that already in the 17th century, they, they, after they revolted against the Dutch, but were not successful. And in fact, some of those revolts, Africans and indigenous people fought together against the Dutch, but the Dutch uh, peeled these coalitions apart and then create these treaties with native people saying, if you will help us keep enslaved people confined to the plantations, if you will act as slave catchers and, uh, and our soldiers, if necessary, then we will reward you with sort of favored trading status. And many of these indigenous people, Carib in particular, were themselves slave traders who, who traded uh, indigenous people from further into the interior to the Dutch to, uh, to work on plantations. And so by, by creating this sort of line of defense around this minuscule colony in this huge jungle uh, in Amazonia, the native people very much helped the Dutch make slavery a possibility. And then throughout the 18th century, they, um, they continue to act as slave catchers with greater or lesser enthusiasm as conditions demand. But on the whole, uh, they want to keep trading uh, with the Dutch and they are also not keen on having large numbers of maroons, as, as uh, Dr. Brown explained, people who escaped slavery and lived on their own in, in villages in the interior, native people don't necessarily want that competition for resources and, and women. Um, and so they fight on the side of the Dutch um, and they're crucial in, in forming a cordon around the colony so that when it becomes clear that the rebels cannot win and people are beginning to talk about, let's get out of here then and set up our own maroon communities, these native peoples make it pretty much impossible for that to happen. Thanks, excellent. We have a question from Rachel Miller. Um, what are the speaker's favorite sources for teaching this material to undergraduates? And, and I, I would say that both of these books, depending on the undergraduates, are, are very readable. They're very accessible for, for audiences um, broader than just scholars. Um, but, but what kinds of sources do you use or what kinds of other works do you use when you, when you teach about this? Yeah, I mean, so I was introduced to this subject by a uh, an undergraduate teacher of mine named Stephen Hahn, who's now at, uh, at, at New York University, who was then at UC San Diego, where I was an undergraduate. And he introduced me to CLR James's Black Jacobins, um, which, you know, I, I've kind of never looked back, <laughs> right? It was one of those books that situated um, the history of slavery, the history of slave revolt, resistance and revolution on a geopolitical canvas, right? Um, it kind of placed these kinds of subjects at the center of world history. Um, and so in that sense, it's kind of been a crucial framing device for me ever since I, I first read that book, um, I, I guess in, in about 1990. Um, so that one, I think, you know, if you start there, you can kind of really build the hunger because I, I still think that when people read Black Jacobins, some scales fall from their eyes. I mean, first of all, most certainly Americans don't know anything about the Haitian Revolution. And if they do, they don't know how important it was. They probably don't know that these rebels defeated Napoleon, <laughs> right? Um, so all of those things that are just kind of so bracing for people to hear, especially when they hear them the first time, I think bring them into the subject in a, in a, in a really powerful way, um, as, as it did for me. But, but as you said, Scott, um, I think that both my book and Professor Carr's book are written for undergraduate audiences as well as for specialists. Um, the idea was that I wanted to be able to tell specialists something that they, you know, they didn't know or hadn't thought about in the same way that I was thinking about it. 
but also that anybody who wanted to pick up a book for the first time would learn something themselves. Um, so really to try and kind of make it nested in that way. My analytical arguments were nested within a story that I, that I believe is accessible to a much broader audience, including undergraduates. Um, it's interesting, Scott, because um, I gave a talk in Guyana uh, online uh, a couple of months ago, and people in Guyana said, why don't we have access to these judicial records? And the Dutch archives have actually put all of it online, but they're in Dutch. And so um, since then, the Dutch archives and uh, folks in Guyana have signed a, an agreement that the Dutch will translate these judicial investigations or at least a good portion of them into English so that people in Guyana who are English speakers can read them without having to learn Dutch. And um, I have been using some of them in my own translations in my courses so that students can read some of them and, uh, and see what they make of them, what kind of questions they have. So I agree with Professor Brown that um, about the books that he spoke about. I think another uh, Dukey uh, and a professor of mine, and I think also of yours, Julius Scott, uh, his book, The Common Wind, is also a wonderful book to use. Yes. Also extremely accessible, wide ranging, and really gives students an idea of how ideas traveled around the Black Atlantic. Um, but I think using primary sources when, po when possible is, is great and, uh, and more and more of them are appearing um, in English now um, and various people are using judicial investigations to look at the lives of enslaved people. Sophie White's book, for instance, uh, in French sources. So as more of those get translated, I think we'll be able to use more of them in our classrooms. And I would add to this, and this builds on something that Vince said earlier, the importance of geography and of maps. You know, the fact, Vince, that you've created an entire mapping of, of Tacky's, Re Tacky's Revolt in order to help people understand the, the places where things happened and the lines of force. And that's another kind of source that students could certainly find very useful. Yeah, well, I mean, thanks for highlighting that because as I think I indicated before, place was an important part of my argument. Um, it wasn't just illustrative of how the revolt happened. I was trying to argue that where things matter, right, um, matters, <laughs> right? Um, that, it, that I was connecting up these people with these places in order to get us to reframe our sense of, of what matters where, of how Africa, how African history plays out in the Americas, how American history might reverberate to Africa, how European empires in some ways are built right, on what's happening in these histories and ter in territories that they don't often think about, right? That the geography itself and the way that the trajectory of people across these landscapes connects up a history may tell us something that the way they think about it doesn't tell us, right? Just looking at their movements across space reframes the context in a way that like their understanding, as you find in their pamphlets, um, and, their, and, their, and, their, and, their, and their diaries doesn't really tell us in the same way. So I actually, I, I kept a cartographer on retainer essentially. Um, as I was finishing the book, I said, look, you know, I would like you to read the book. This is a woman named Molly Roy in California who's a fantastic cartographer. I said, please read the book and, and work with me to develop a series of maps that would stand alone that if someone just looked at the maps themselves, they would have a sense of the story even before they read the book. Even if they didn't want to read the book, the maps can tell the story on their own. And she was brilliant at bringing that out so that when you see the maps together with the book, they kind of, they fit together perfectly. But if you just looked at the maps, I think you would already have a sense of what happened. Um, and so again, kind of working with someone whose job is to think about space, to represent space, to illustrate, to analyze it and illustrate it, uh, it was really a fantastic thing for me to, to, to have available to me because I was actually asking that question about how it was that I could make space matter to my readers um, when, I, when, I wrote the, when I wrote the book about the revolt. Yeah. It also makes you think again about how are the traditions of our field, which is for us to work alone, obviously standing on the shoulders of others by using their books and their research, is not necessarily the most efficient way to do it that having an interdisciplinary team, for instance, study a 
rebellion, such as the one in Jamaica or in Berbice, would be a, a fascinating way to do it. Um, well, rather one than have we, one mind. You know. One of the things we share as historians from below is an understanding that you know individuals are artifacts, that individuals emerge mm -hmm. from context, they emerge from relationships. And describing those relationships and those processes which shape relationships might be more important than the individual names themselves, or at least as important. Yeah. And, and every one of us who's written a book knows that writing a book is hardly a solitary pursuit, even though if, even if the sure. writing is, we're working with librarians, we're working with archivists, uh, we're working with curators, much like, the, much like the librarians and curators here at the American Antiquarian Society who make such a difference in, in what we find and, and what we make of it. Uh, we have several questions now, um, several additional questions. I'm going to go to one from Alonzo Smith, um, who's presently working on narratives of resistance in long 19th century Black masculinities, and the Gold Coast figures prominently because of this uh, Alonzo Smith's chapter on Venture Smith. Uh, can you speak to any connections between Venture Smith and the Gold Coast? Also, the Gold Coast peoples appeal, appear more passive in Venture's text as opposed to the way they're portrayed in Tacky's Revolt. Uh, what do you attribute that to? And Venture Smith um, being um, an enslaved man who became free in uh, what is now the United States, I believe in, in Connecticut, um, in, in the late 18th, early 19th century. So if any yeah. of you reviewed Well, I mean, I, I can't tell you anything about Venture Smith that you don't know, um, but, but I will say that, um, that again, kind of the representation of the Gold Coast in a text like that is, is from a perspective, but it's also for a purpose, right? Um, and so what I was trying to do is kind of go back and really fill out the, the history of war and diplomacy and trade on the Gold Coast that played out in, in Jamaica. And I think you can see it playing out in other parts of the Americas as well, before we go to a text like, like Venture Smith's um, and his representation of it. So my sources weren't primarily kind of narrative accounts of Africa, of which we don't have that many in the first place. They were really, you know, records of castle forts, right? And the kinds of trading relationships they developed. So anytime someone would come to trade at the fort, there'd be a record of expenses and often the names of the people who came to the fort. So I tried to piece together what was happening around the forts um, and then put that together what we know of African state building at the time, so that we could see how African state building was reverberating down to the forts and then reverberating across to the Americas. So a bit of a different project than a project that's most about the, the post-factor representation of Africa. What I was trying to do was to kind of burrow in, and as I said, get a sense of the relationships that continued in, in transformed ways on the other side of the Atlantic. Thanks. We have a, a broader question from John Carew, and this is a question that we can often think about in relation to many different revolts, rebellions, and wars in many different times. Why do some oppressed people assist oppressors in oppressing their own people? Well, I mean, Marlene has great answers to this that are in her book, but I mean, the first, the first question is you know, about their own people, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, that, that is a fluid and yeah. changing and dynamic thing, how people define like and non-like. Yeah. Right? We can see it in the United States today. Who considers their fellow Americans their own people? I mean, there are people right now who think they have more in common with you know, Russians than with other Americans. Right. The understanding of who's an American, who counts, who's a fellow is changing before our very eyes. Right. Again, you can look at this world and most of what we have studied in wars to, to, to this point is white on white violence. Hundred years of war between the, the British and the French. Right. The British are at war with the Dutch. The, the French are at war with the Spanish. The Spanish are at war with the British. We might look back on that and say, wow, kind of why, why are all, all of these white people fighting against each other? Well, you have to understand how they define themselves, right? Who their fellows are, what categories of belonging they make. And as it turns out, those categories of belonging are changing, right? Not all the Africans from the Gold Coast are part of the same polity or same ethnicity or have the same interests. Same, same happens in slavery, 
where not all of the, you know, 90% of the population that's enslaved in the Caribbean, right, shares a common identity, right? If we think of them only as slaves or as blacks, it might seem obvious that they do. But again, looking at their predicament, looking back in their time, that's not the only axis of identification they had. They had these ethnic axes of identification. They had gendered axes of identification. They had their roles in the plantation economy, right? All of those things mattered. And when one takes that history seriously, again, as Professor Cars and I both do, takes black politics seriously, one has to take differences among black people just as seriously as you take differences between blacks and whites. Yes. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And I also would say that in any situation of war and revolution, people's uh, identities shift over time. I mean, we've seen that even in the last year ourselves during COVID, that people that we have begun to think about ourselves differently and we have reacted to events differently. And that's uh, th that, that the same happens. So that whatever identities people may have ascribed to themselves before a cataclysmic event like this, in the midst of it, those notions of self begin to change. And people have different ideas of not only who they are, but what is in their own best interest. Yeah. That's right. And the world that we're describing is cataclysm after cataclysm after cataclysm, yes. right? Um, so we have a couple more questions. I'm going to get, try to get to one or two, but I know we're running out of time soon. Uh, D. Andrews says, brilliant focus on the 1760s. Does either scholar know if Pontiac's rebellion had sources in Caribbean revolts, at least in terms of the status sands of empire? Any connections? So I don't know the answer to that question. The, the first place I would go to look for that is War Under Heaven by Gregory Evans Dowd. Um, to, 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 to see um, how to answer that. Um, but we do know that certainly in the case of Tacky's Revolt, there were many people exiled from the island who'd been involved in the revolt or who had experience of it one way or another. Um, we know, we have documented shipping records that show that some of them ended up in South Carolina, some of them ended up in Virginia. Um, and so we can assume that they told the story to others and how that story was interpreted um, in North America, that we don't know, but but we know but we know that people carried that story with them. I also think that there is an awful lot more work to be done. For instance, on indigenous people in Amazonia in the 18th century, and when we do more of that work, we may learn that um, there were all kinds of things brewing there that could be compared to what happened uh, to. Uh, Pontiac's rebellion in North America, because all of these things, I mean, that's what we're finding more and more is all these different struggles, all these different attempts at changing the world, they're all related, not only because of slavery and capitalism, uh, but of colonialism. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if indeed more connections would would become clear, just as we realized that there are connections between what was happening in Berbice and what was happening in neighboring colonies, for instance. And those connections aren't just among the rebels, right? So when one thinks right. about the new British imperial policy that North American colonists reacted so strongly against, right? That policy is being reshaped in the context of thinking not only about what happened during the Seven Years' War, not only, you know, Pontiac's Rebellion, but Tacky's Revolt at the same time. So all of these things are tied together also in the minds of policymakers mm -hmm. when they go to draft new policies, taxation policies, etc., cetera, um, that the North American colonists revolt against in the 1770s. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We have several questions here. I'm going to wrap them up together and ask for just brief answers because we are running out of time. But we have several questions here about sources and illustrations. Uh, one one uh, questioner, Leslie Munns, has asked um, Vince about uh, whether you found documentary sources on the islands or from Great Britain about basically the documentary sources for your work. Um, and we also have a question about visual images um, from Adrienne Van Dyke, who, who asks, uh, he, she says, um, I often thought that art and artifacts are perhaps the best way to fix in the minds of a reader what different cultures and civilizations are like. Were you able to find and reproduce as illustrations many of these in your book? And I, I will say that um, I encourage everybody to, to read these books and you will find illustrations 
collections that the authors have found in various sources in various museums and so on, not necessarily specifically of these revolts, but of things that are, are relevant and related. But if we want to say anything about sources as a, as a way of wrapping up, we can, we can do that. I mean, Mari Lane, you've got a lot of great illustrations here. I think that's, you know, that's one of the fun uh, things. In your book. Yes, and, uh, and I, but there, there are almost no artifacts or illustrations specific to Berbies. So I looked for um, uh, illustrations that, that, that looked at people of African descent in the new world in that time period in the most sympathetic ways I could find. Um, and I found a whole lot at the Rex Museum, which allows scholars to use all their illustrations and everything for free. So that was also very important. Um, but the archaeology, for instance, in Berbice is, is really still in its infancy. So I'm sure there is a lot there if people were to look, but the work hasn't been done yet. Yeah. yeah. One of the reasons that I spent so much time describing the landscape itself, because the mm -hmm. landscape was not only a context, right? It was a part of the events, right? A fundamental part of the events. Yeah. Uh, and so that in Jamaica is something that's obviously still there. People can still see, not the exact same landscape, obviously, but you know, they, they, they understand when they read the book that this happened in the place where they are. Um, and so I think of that not just as an artifact, but as a but as a kind of living testament to the world that these people lived in that, frankly, we still live in ourselves. It's absolutely a source. And, and just as a teaser for, for Mary Elaine's book, Mary Elaine begins the book with the story of of her own voyage down the, up, up the river um, when you were beginning this project to, to understand that landscape, because it is mm -hmm. such a critical part of the entire yes. story. You've got to understand the landscapes. I want to say an enormous thank you to Mary Elaine Cars and Vincent Brown for this evening. This has been a terrific conversation. I hope that we all think about the 1760s in different ways than we might be used to and think about the age of revolutions in different ways, thanks to these books and thanks to this conversation. I'm very grateful. I'm grateful to everybody who has joined us this evening. And I want to say that we have more public programs coming up two days from now. We have a program with the costume historian, um, text historian Lynn Bassett about the American Girl Dolls. And then two weeks from tonight, we have a program that I think is quite related to what we were talking about tonight. I'll be talking with the author Robert Parkinson about his book, 13 Clocks, How Race United the Colonies and Made the Declaration of Independence, a book very much about the ways in which fears of racial uprest, or, or unrest in the United States or in the, in the colonies helped create the United States. Uh, another another mm -hmm lesser known story of the age of revolutions. So I encourage you to join us for those. And I, again, I thank you for joining us tonight. Have a very good evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.